seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Thank you, Max. All right, we are going to look at this passage. And I'm going to guess, you may have heard this passage before. I'm going to guess the idea of asking and seeking and knocking is not new to you like it was to those people on the hillside 2,000 years ago. I remember hearing this description of a man who did a lot of incredible things in a lot of different areas. And I remember a one sentence description that made this man unique. It said, he woke up every day seeing the world with new eyes. Seeing the world with new eyes. That may be a lot for us, but I'm going to ask us to do that at least for the next half hour as we look at this passage. I want us to look at it with new eyes, to ask questions about it, to think through it. To ask what it means to myself. Will you do that? Let's pray and ask God for, that, as, for that as we begin. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this passage that you gave through your son Jesus. That you are indeed a father to us. And that gives us certain responsibilities but also certain privileges and rights. Thank you for that. Father, I would ask that you would fill me with wisdom, the wisdom of your spirit as I convey this. Help me to be clear. I pray that you would help this sermon to lift you up so that we see you in a greater way than we did before, so that you are magnified and we are drawn to you, towards you because of that. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, would you also then tap us on the shoulders when a part of this sermon applies to us, show us what we should do in response, please. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we have a very short passage here, again, very familiar. And I thought maybe the way to actually kind of dive into this is to ask a couple of questions about it that maybe we haven't thought of, or one of these we certainly have. First question would be this. <clears throat> all right. Why no asterisks here? Jesus says you can ask and you will receive. You can seek and you will find. You will knock and the door open. We're waiting for the asterisk there, right? We're waiting for the qualifications. We're waiting to read the 75 pages of terms and conditions. Um, and, and boy, we're familiar with those today. There was a study by the Atlantic Magazine, and they looked at the 75 um, websites most common in the United States. So if you're an average American, you're going to read most of these during, say, a week or a month. And they determined that if you read the terms and conditions of that, it would take 25 eight-hour days for those 75 websites to read the terms and conditions. We're familiar with that. We're familiar with the idea of small print. And yet Jesus gives us a statement that is so broad and sweeping, we wonder, hey, where are the asterisks here? And I think the answer is this, because he knows our biggest problem is not that we spent too much out of prayer, but too little. Of course, this isn't to say that God gives us everything that we desire. God is not a vending machine in the sky that if we put in the right amount of prayer of the right currency, the right form, then he gives what we want. He's not our personal genie in a bottle that we can say, God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And, and we rub the lamp with prayer, as it were, and we receive whatever we ask for. That is not how life works. That's not how it works in the scriptures, and it's certainly not how I've experienced walking with God. Maybe your mileage is different there, right? 
Any of you gotten everything you've ever asked for in prayer? But he gives this blanket statement to show us the heart of God towards us. Now, again, it's the heart of the Father. And if we've ever had children, we know that some of the things they ask for are not really the best things for them, right? And uh, we can think of many things we've probably asked for ourselves as children or maybe as adults. And we ask with God in prayer, and we look back and go, ooh, glad he didn't answer that prayer. Not the way I want it anyway. He knows our biggest problem, though, is not that we're too worried about uh, too much prayer, but too little. Let's go to the second question here. And that kind of builds upon this. What about unanswered prayer, then? What about unanswered prayer? We certainly have that. I, I, I'm going to give us three what I think are pointers in the right direction. Sometimes we just have to admit that we don't know. God's ways aren't our ways, and we're not going to try to, we're not going to be able to figure him out completely. But I think at least three things can help us. First of all, we're often asking for the wrong things. So Jesus does not give asterisks, but we need to also interpret his words in the context of what he's been talking about, right? So we can't just pull out this section of five or six verses and use it to apply to anything. And it's, it's within the context of this Sermon on the Mount. So what are the things he's been talking about so far? Well, he's been talking about our need for humility, poverty of spirit, about our need for mourning over our sin, for hungering and thirsting after righteousness, for being meek, for being pure in heart, for being merciful, for being a peacemaker. Are we praying for that kind of thing? He's talking about living without anger and lust in Matthew in chapter 5. He's talking about living without deceit or not worrying what people think about us. Not seeking revenge, even against people who hurt us. Are we praying for those kinds of things? Just in this last chapter, he's talking about, or last chapter 2, loving those who hurt me. Seeking his kingdom and its righteousness. Seeking freedom from anxiety because of a deepening trust in him. Seeking freedom from judging each other. Are we praying for those things? Or are most of our prayers about things that are not eternal and spiritual, but physical and temporal? Now, I'm not saying those things are wrong. I'm just saying we probably don't have the right mixture here, right? So some of us remember, some of you may still have, uh, certain lawn instruments that require like this four cycle engine you have to put in the right mixture of gasoline and oil in the same place and if you don't get the right mixture uh, it's just not going to work it's going to gum up well not appropriate analogy but we're not told that we can't pray for our daily needs in fact jesus says in the sermon uh, in the lord's prayer give us today our daily bread that's part of six petitions of prayer though that are focused more upon the spiritual and eternal aspects of who we are. Because you have to remember something, right? You are not just a being of today, or even this 10 years, or even this 70 or 80, 90 years. You are an eternal, living creation of God. And whatever happens in this life, whatever happens in this life, whether we interpret that good or bad, in some ways, is more of a preparation for the life to come. Now, it's real. It has import. It has meaning. But the meaning of it all is if you are really an eternal being, then there is something that this life prepares for the next. And so too often, what I'm saying is our prayers are not answered because we are not praying the right things. And then secondly, <clears throat> oh, James says this, by the way. This is still on that same point. You do not have because you don't ask God. And that's really true, isn't it? Think of those things I just listed or other things that are important. Why don't I have more of that? Well, probably because I'm not asking. But often when we ask, it says we don't receive because we ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it upon what you, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures or desires is the idea. One more passage here. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, notice how different Paul prays than what we, than how we usually pray. So he's writing to this group of, of Christians in Ephesus. 
That's why I call it Ephesians. City called Ephesus. And he's apparently heard about them, but he hasn't visited them yet, or at least it's not been for a while, because it says, I've heard about what's happening. I've heard about what's happening and how God's Spirit is moving among you and, and changing you. So we usually pray for problems, right? He's praying out of an overflow of thanks for what God's doing. It says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And most Bible scholars think that the way he phrases that in the Greek, in my prayers, implies that he had set times for prayer. It says, I keep asking. Notice the tense there. I keep asking. What? that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Oh, think of all the things the people in Ephesus needed. They were so new in the faith, so young. They were living in a hostile culture, much more hostile to the Christian faith than ours is, where persecution could break out at a moment's notice. He says, I'm praying that you would know God better. And I pray that your heart may be enlightened in order to you, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This is how Paul models the kind of things we're to be praying for. And then secondly, often we give up too soon. <laughs> often we give up too soon. In other words, sometimes we pray for, pray for things, and yet there's a part of us that needs some process of working through that coming to God again and again before it's the right time for him to answer that prayer. I don't know how all that works. I remember, say, when my daughter Sarah was, was very young, about 11, she expressed an interest in playing tennis, right? And eventually she, she did play tennis in uh, middle school and high school. Um, but, you know, the first time she asked me that, we did not go out, even though she, she wanted to uh, learn how to play tennis, we did not go out and buy her a $400 racket and sign her up for a tennis clinic uh, three months, you know, in Florida or something. We didn't, we didn't hire a tennis pro at $300 an hour to come and teach her lessons. Why? Because at 11 years old, she needed to develop that, that desire and see if that's really what she wanted to do or not. And by, by giving her all those things, we would have overwhelmed her. What I mean by that is that there are some things that develop within us as we ask. And God knows it can be premature to, to answer that at a certain time. Luke 18, Jesus gives a parable. And notice, I, I love how Luke sometimes does this. He tells us why Jesus gave the parable. That they should always pray and not give up. So he tells them a parable about a judge who neither feared God or cared what people thought. So he doesn't care about God, doesn't care about people. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will go see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Okay, maybe that's... <laughs> he might be overstating the case there. But anyway, the point Jesus makes is this. It's a contrast here. Jesus is not saying that God is like the judge, he's contrasting with the judge. If that judge, a human judge, will do that, if someone keeps asking, how much more will your father help you when you keep persisting in asking? Remember uh, in that passage we looked at in Ephesians, what do you say there? I keep asking. I keep asking. And here in this passage, pray, seek, and knock, those are all in what's called the present imperative. And the, the, language, the way that language works, if you want to say do thing one time, that you would use what's called an aorist. If you want to say to keep on doing something, make it a regular part, you would use the present tense. And that's what he uses. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. All right, third thing. Sometimes we simply have to trust that his no is, in some way, a yes. I imagine Joseph in Egypt. During those 14 years or so that he was locked in prison, 
or as a slave in Potiphar's household, prayed for relief. And he didn't get it until the time was right for something much beyond what he could understand and see. I wonder if that's not a metaphor, maybe for our whole life, of what God is doing inwardly in us that will only be expressed perhaps after our death. Paul prayed in unanswered prayer. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. doesn't tell us what it was. Some people speculate epilepsy. Some people said it was failing eyesight. But he really wanted that taken away so he could focus on the ministry more. And uh, he says, three times I begged God, earnestly pled for God to take it away. And God said, no. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul prefaces that by saying, I was given this thorn so I would not become puffed up because of all the other great gifts that God had given to me. So he understood there was a spiritual reason for this physical ailment. Now, his situation and ours are not going to be quite the same, obviously. But the point is that very often God doesn't answer our requests. Even good requests take this thorn away from me. Not because the request is wrong, but because there are greater purposes that we don't see or understand that are at play here that he sees and we don't. Jesus in Gethsemane. Father, if it's your will, take this cup. The cup being a symbol of all that he was about to endure on the cross. If it's your will, take it from me. But nevertheless, not as I desire, not as I will, but what you do. This takes trust. This takes trust. This takes the ability to live with these two truths that we have a loving Father. We have a loving Father who desires to grant us all that's good for us. And yet, he doesn't answer the prayers the way that we, do, that we think he should. Walking in faith is walking in tension, holding both those truths in at the same time. All right, third question here. How does the golden rule fit into this? So you remember how he ends this? And I actually, I, when I was researching and studying for this week, this was the, the one part of this. I, was, I really don't know what's going on here. Um, why, why is this here? It doesn't seem to fit in with this idea of prayer at all. And let me give us two answers to this. Number one, Matthew is structuring this sermon in a, in a very clever way. Now, technically, the word is a chiasm or chiastic is the, is the uh, adjective form of that. And in that way of doing things, remember, this was a time where people were not going to be able to write down things for the most part. So this was an aid in memory to some degree, but this device was also a way that you could emphasize which parts fit together as a parallel, and then also which part was preeminent, which is going to be the part in the middle. I don't know if you can read that real well, um, we're actually going to be in two or three weeks recapping the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll have this printed out for you. But the first part you see, Jesus ascends the mountain and begins teaching. And then the last verse of chapter 7, first verse of chapter 1 says, and Jesus finished speaking, and the people responded with wonder, and he descended the mountain. So it's very clear. He's using words here that are trying to parallel to each other. And the first, there's an invitation to the kingdom, especially here you have the Beatitudes. And then next week, Nathan is going to spend first of two Sundays about um, the conclusion, the warnings and the invitation to walk in the narrow gate, to build your house upon the rock and not the sand. So it's a call, resp- it's a call to respond in a certain way. And then this middle part then is the bulk of the Sermon on the Mount. And in each case, it's framed by this kingdom righteousness, or, I'm sorry, it's, it's framed by the words of the law of the prophets. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And here Jesus concludes by saying, when you do this, and I believe then he's referring to all that comes after uh, 520, when you do all of this, this is, fulfills the law and the prophets. This sums up the law and the prophets. And so you have then chapter 5 about kingdom righteousness, and then you have 
the passages we've looked at in the last few weeks about kingdom living. And in the middle of that, you have Jesus' teaching on true worship. And in the middle of that is a section on prayer. So what's cool about this, I don't know if this is intentional. I think it is. But if you turn that sideways, you go up the mountain and you come back down. Isn't that cool? I won't say 100% that Matthew has this idea of the mountain analogy here. I like to think he does, but anyway. And again, we'll have uh, some, you can ask me for these slides if you want. I'm not sure how well you can read those or not. Um, or we'll have these again in a couple weeks. So that's certainly one part of why this is included here. But I think the other part is this. That it's when you understand the goodness of God as your father and that you have all the riches and resources that he has available to you, subject only to what he determines is best for you, then you are able to really live out this freedom of giving unconditional grace and love and acceptance and help to other people. And and this kind of, Jesus just sums sums it all up here. Okay, so you've got all the Old Testament law and prophets, but here's what you do if you don't have a command specific. You, you look at yourself and say, if I was in their situation, what would I want that person to do to me? And that's going to be your guide. And again, this isn't a rule. It's not iron class. Some people are just weird. And what they want may not really be a good, good idea. But as a general idea or rule, this sums up. The idea being this. Righteousness is not about keeping a bunch of rules. It's about becoming a person who is so trusting in God that then they are able to live a life where they do not place their own desires as paramount and then view and interpret everyone else in that light. But instead they're able to look at other people and love them to the same degree that they love themselves. So the scripture assumes that we self-seek that we seek the things that are good for us. That's not wrong. But the problem is we don't do that to poor other people. We don't also seek their good. And that's what kingdom righteousness is. It's not fulfilling a bunch of rules. It is receiving from God this gift of grace through Jesus Christ so that we have this Father and then we can live this way towards other people. All right. <clears throat> so last question, as it were. How do we respond? I'm going to suggest three things. Uh, let your father's good, I'm sorry, two things. Well, this first one has three parts. Let your father's goodness prompt you to prayer. Let your father's goodness prompt you to prayer. And here's where I'm going with this. I know we're already praying. But let's revise this. Let's revise what we're praying for is where I'm going. Based on what we just talked about in a few minutes ago about how Jesus and Paul both model praying for different things. There's, there's a different content, a different mix. Again, we can re- present our request to God for ourselves and other people, things that are on our heart. We should. But let's not make that like 98% of that mixture, right? Let's, let's bring in these other requests. So refine or almost put remix there because all of a sudden these, this really became... Um, the R words here. Because the second one is then request. Got some alliteration going. Don't usually do this, but worked out really well this time. Request. And here's where I'm going with this. Request simply on the basis that you have a father who cares about you and who desires to give you good things. Only because he is a father. So many of my prayer times So many things I haven't prayed for because I have in the back of my mind that somehow I haven't earned the right to pray because this this problem is like 98% my own making sometimes, right? Or I feel like I've been a bozo in other areas. I haven't been consistent reading my Bible. I've, you know, given into this sin or that sin or, and, and, and there's this idea and maybe this isn't like you, but, may, but maybe some of you it is, that I have to be a certain way, that I have to level up to a certain kind of performance spiritually before I can really approach God. And Jesus is having none of it. There is not one word in this of a performance-based prayer. It's all because you have a Father.
You know, you can read every page of this Old Testament. You can read every page. You can read every line, three-fourths of your Bible. And you will not find in all of the Old Testament one time where a person prayed to God as Father. There are 14 times when God is called the Father of Israel, but that idea of a personal relationship with an individual is entirely absent from the Old Testament. In fact, you can look at the extra-biblical literature of, a, of the time period. So not only the Old Testament, but the Jewish people wrote many other books that are not considered canonical. They're not part of the scriptures. And in all those books, which dwarf the Old Testament, you still will not find one person praying to God as Father. And yet when Jesus comes on the scene, he does it no other way. Every time he prays to God, it says Father, and he teaches us to do it also. There's one quasi-exception to this. Anybody know what it is? It's a tough one. Jesus on the cross prays, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he uses the word theos there. Why? Well, not because he was feeling forsaken by God's fatherhood necessarily, but because he was quoting the Old Testament uh, prophecy about him in Psalm 22, which did use the more general word God, so he's using that word there because he's quoting and fulfilling, showing he's fulfilling that Old Testament prophecy every other time. In fact, I counted 12 times just between the last half of chapter 5 in Matthew, which we've been studying, and the first half of chapter 7, so about two chapters, I counted 12 times where Jesus calls God our Father. And at least about half a dozen times where he refers to each other, he refers helps us refer to each other as brothers and sisters. This is amazing. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you think about it, you have access to God as a father because Jesus Christ has paid the way through the cross for your sin debt to be paid for, so that you can have a renewed relationship with God. And the one word that Jesus says should characterize that relationship to God when we pray his father. That's a wonderful thing. Bring your request to God as father. And then lastly, repeat. Repeat. And we've already looked at this, so I'm not going to I'm not going to repeat all this necessarily, but Ephesians 117, remember, I keep on asking. Remember that continuous test, uh, continuous tense. Ask, seek, knock. And then one last part here. Let your Father's goodness prompt you to be like this towards other people. Let your Father's goodness prompt you to be like this towards other people. You have all you need. You are fully provided for, so now you can fully love. I remember, I remember in school, um, I was not part of the cool kids club, you know. And, uh, you know, my family was not not intact at that point. And uh, there was, I was on the struggle bus in some areas. But the other people, the people who were successful athletics, people who, who had, you know, uh, a lot of wealth in their family, people who were really accomplished and mature for their age, unlike me at that time, um, you know, they seemed to have this this much better experience in high school. And here's what I noticed. There are two kinds of people within that upper class, as you want to call it. One, who would look down upon anyone else who wasn't up to their standards. And the second group, though, were those who, out of the idea that they were well provided for and taken care of and that they're, they were stable, were able to express a love and concern for other people, other students. Not a perfect analogy, but what I'm trying to get at is that if we really get how deeply we are loved, that we have a father like this, this can be the foundation, the way that gives impetus and power and motivation to becoming like this person who does to others what they would have done to themselves. That's difficult. That's difficult. 
but the motivation for that and the assurance that I'm not going to lose out if I do that is right here in the words of Jesus. We're going to uh, turn to communion right now. And let's give some...